All right, so this is part three of a four-part series talking about long wire antennas and nine-to-one ununs, RF chokes, and antenna tuners. Uh, this is part three, which is going to focus primarily on the RF choke. So, question, why do we need an RF choke? Well, what we're concerned about is the RF power or energy radiating back into our operating area or back into our shack. As I mentioned earlier in part one, this can cause damage to your equipment or cause your equipment not to operate properly and also exposes you to RF energy, which is not as safe as uh, it should be. So yeah, I picked up a few RF burns uh, off of my equipment and tried grounding. Grounding just masks the problem. Uh, this will actually eliminate it. So yeah, we need to um, reduce or eliminate column mode currents on the outside of your feed line. So this could be the shielding on a coax cable. Um, now, the way I'm using it, my coax cable, my shielding is my counterpoise. So it's actually the, the other element of my antenna and it's gonna radiate RF. So that's how I'm using it for my particular setup. Um, next, to reduce RF back into the shack, right? Okay, it's a safety issue. And then to uh, reduce the, the noise level in your receiver. Um, there's a couple of drawbacks with these long wire antennas. Um, one is that it, it does pick up excessive noise. So the RF choke helps to filter out that noise. Okay, so this is my RF choke. And I've got it set up here with these BNC connectors so I can make various measurements very easily. Uh, when, I, when I get this finalized, and I get my testing all done. I'll be putting on some PL239 connectors and putting it in line with my equipment. Uh, let's go back and, and briefly visit that again. Here's the diagram that I showed in the beginning of the video. And here's the nine to one un un. Okay, now I'm not using a counterpoise off the grounding stud. Uh, again, I'm using the RF shielding. So I'm gonna put the RF choke after the shielded coax, okay? And uh, basically in line with my antenna tuner. I don't wanna choke out the, the RF energy on the shield because I am using that as the counterpoise. So it's, it's the other radial of my antenna. So I choke it out right before it enters my equipment. Um, now the other alternatives using a nine to one un un um, is to use the, the ground lug here and you can use a, a long wire, uh, one wavelength long uh, as a counterpoise, that works fine. Um, you can also use a number of radials, okay, that, but they need to be located close to the ground. Um, so you can use a combination of both, both the long wire and radials. So there's a lot of good information on the internet, but again, my situation, being in the attic and being well above ground, um, I elected to use the coax, and it actually works fairly well, as, as you will see when we get the whole system up and running back together and um, be able to demonstrate that in part four. Um, so here's where my RF choke is going. And let's talk a little bit. I said I'd go back and, and revisit this topic Let's talk about a ballon versus an RF choke, okay? And this is for common current, okay? So on my left here, we have a ballon, and it basically goes from an unbalanced system to a balanced system. So unbalanced would be the output of our transceiver, right? We have the center conductor of the coax, and then we go to ground, okay? And then this converts it to unbalanced. So we have two signals that are 180 degrees out of phase from, from one another. So let's take a look at this, at this diagram, right? Here's my carrier coming from the transceiver. Okay, so it's balanced. This is ground right here. 
And then the unbalanced, you can see I have basically two sine waves that are 180 degrees out of phase. And I would use this to, to basically drive a center fed antenna like a horizontal dipole that has two, two radials. Okay, so, so that's this configuration. And you can see the, the crossover here in the winding. Okay, then if we go to the un un, it's unbalanced to unbalanced. So we have unbalanced from our transceiver, right? And then unbalanced on, on this end. So you can see both have a common ground. And this would be for an NFED antenna, like the one that I'm building, the, the multi-band long wire antenna. Okay, and then I'm using the coaxial shielding as the counterpoise, so the other radial. So, so that's the difference. You see signal coming in here. Signal coming out here in phase and grounded. So that's the primary difference between the Balan and the Un Un. And the, the Un Un is a one to one. Um, so, what we're trying to do is to eliminate the noise that will couple into the shielding um, and attenuate, attenuate that. So, we're going to do some, some testing, some measurements on that. So here's the one-to-one -one on on. I'm using that as again my choke and it's unbalanced to unbalanced. Okay and again there's different ferrite materials that can be used here. Okay a lot of manufacturers offer material 31 and that's good for 160 to 20 meters. And then you can use material 43, which is good from 40 meters all the way up to 6 meters. So now we get into the lower side of the VHF band, right, around 50 megahertz. Okay, so here's the, the core material that we'd use. Remember, 240 is 2.4 inches. This is material 31. Has a higher permeability, 1500. So it's going to have a much higher impedance. Number of turns... 10 to 12, okay, and we can either use 50 ohm coax or uh, two conductor wire, uh, depending on how we're wiring this and what we're using it for and what our application is. Okay, and then the material 43, again, it's a 240 core. Um, the permeability is 850, so much less. Number of turns the same. And here's basically our uh, 50 ohm coax or two conductor wire. So that's what the diagram looks like. Now I elected to use coax and, and like the un un, um, depending on the, the power rating, we need to use a large enough core and we need to use large enough coax cable. So this will handle about a thousand watts or so based on the size of this core and where it saturates and also the rating of this cable. Um, this is uh, RG316, so it's it's rated a pretty, pretty high wattage and, and voltage. Okay, so how do we know this thing works, right? We put it on our line and we think, okay, I'm uh, suppressing the, the radiation coming down the coax and I'm safe and my equipment's safe. And so how do we really know that it's working properly? Well, if you look at the center conductor, right, of our coax, that's really what, what carries the signal, right? Um, we would not expect this to attenuate or add impedance, right? Because then we're gonna affect the, the 50 ohm impedance match we have for our antenna system, right? So 50 ohms at our transceiver and 50 ohms for our coax and then our antenna tuned to resonance, right? So we can't really add any significant impedance to, to the center conductor, which carries the, the, the RF signal, the carrier wave, right? So you can test this a number of ways, but I believe this is the most reliable Again, using the Nano VNA, but this time we're going to use port 1 and port 2. Port 1 is 50 ohms. Port 2 is 50 ohms. Okay. Port 1 sends out a signal, goes through the RF choke, comes back in, and it can measure 
the SWRs. It can measure the impedance. And what we would we expect? We'd expect the SWRs to be basically a one-to-one, -one, right? Otherwise, we're going to add a lot of impedance, and there's no way we're going to be able to match our antenna system. So I set this up. Let's go back over to the software. Okay, and basically this is set up the same. I'm, I'm sweeping from 1 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Here's my SWRs, okay? The scale is from 1 to 6. And if you look very, very closely there, you can see there's the curve for SWRs. I got my pointer in the center of the band, and you can see the SWRs are 1.08. Okay, so that's what we would expect. Very little change to, to the SWRs, right? Okay, and also to the 50 ohm impedance, okay? Slight change. We go from 50 to just around 53 and then back down to maybe 52. Um, so it doesn't really have a significant effect on the signal that's being transmitted. And the reason why is the center conductor is shielded. So it's not being affected by the impedance that's added by the toroid. But the shielding, we expect the shielding to, to uh, show us a significant attenuation. Now we can replace one of these charts. Bear with me here a moment. Okay, and we have the uh, SWRs, right? So we can look at also S21, which is, which is the gain, okay? So we wouldn't want to see that much attenuation in the gain, right? And it's 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 about 0.5 dB there. So that's that's very good. There's very little attenuation. When we when we look at the shielding, we expect to see 30, 40, maybe 60 dB. It's going to vary with with frequency, but this is very flat. Okay? So you can see that it does not affect the gain, there's, there's no attenuation there. It's about a half a decibel over the whole frequency. So it's working very well over, over the, the one megahertz to 30 megahertz range. So now we're gonna take a look at the shielding and see the difference. All right, so now I'm back. And I went ahead and switched the polarity on the coax cable. That's why I'm using these type of connectors. It makes it very easy to rewire it. And now I'm using the coax shielding as the center conductor. So we can go ahead and measure what the SWRs would be for the shielding and also the impedance and the gain. So let's go over to the software again. And uh, the first chart we have, again, we're scanning, same thing throughout all the videos, 1 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Um, I had to rescale my SWRs to read up to 100 SWRs. So you can see that at the lower end, we're actually above 100. Um, in, in the center, we're around 50. And then on the higher end, we're closer to 60. So you can see the SWRs are quite high here. And now let's take a look, make this a little clearer. If we go ahead and change the display and take a look at the gain, okay? And this will show us how much attenuation we're getting with with the ferrite. Okay, so, so this is the gain, okay? You can see at the lower end, we're getting uh, minus 20, minus 30, dB of attenuation, it's quite a bit. And then in the center of the frequency, it's almost minus 70, you can see there, and it goes up to about minus 30. So yes, the, the shielding wrapped around the, the toroid, the, the ferrite core, has a very, very high impedance, is giving us a very, very high SWR, and is giving us up to 70 dB of attenuation. So this will, will certainly prevent the RF from entering into the, the operating area and protecting you and protecting your equipment. 
So it's quite a difference between the center conductor, which is not really affected. You saw that on the SWR chart because it's shielded. And then the outer shielding, because it's wrapped around the ferrite, you can see there's, there's quite a bit of attenuation there to prevent the, the RF from, from radiating into your equipment, coupling into your equipment. Um, so that's all I really wanted to talk about. Um, it's very easy to, to wind this. Uh, the, the diagram is, is fairly simple, as you can see there. And you can see the different materials that are used. If you Google this and you look at different manufacturers, you're going to see these two materials come up. You can, you can buy these toroids from Arrow or, or Mauser. They're about 5 or $6 a piece. Um, so this, again, is a, a T240, so it's 2.4 inches. And, uh, yeah, you can use either 31 or 43. Um, I'm actually going to build one of each um, because I'd like to have a lot of protection when I use my rig. And uh, it's not a big problem to, to switch over. Um, so you could even do it with a coax switch. So take the coax, make sure it has a high enough rating. Okay, give about 10 or 12 windings. You can see that uh, this is heavy, high powered coax, high voltage. So I tie wrap it at the beginning of the winding, tie wrap it at the end of the winding. And then uh, I'm just putting this in line you can put this in a box, like I showed for the 9 to 1 un un. You can put it in a weatherproof box, and you can use uh, SO239 connectors that way. Um, but I'm going to have this inside next to my equipment, and I'm just going to put it in line. Um, so should be uh, should be no problem to use it that way. So thanks again. And we'll uh, have uh, part four, we'll talk about the antenna tuner, and then in that part we'll actually put together the entire antenna system, and we'll go ahead and do some tuning with a couple of different radios using the internal tuner and external tuner. Okay, RF man, thanks.